students are challenged to present their research in five minutes using only one static slide to a panel of five judges and a virtual audience. Originally, the five minute fast track was modeled after the grad school's three minute thesis competition. We designed this competition specifically to build upon the students' communication skills when, dis when discussing their undergraduate research with diverse audiences. Student researchers are not automatically trained to communicate their work in layman terms. Oral presentations are one of the best platforms where nonverbal skills are combined with effective verbal skills and a broader aspect to a student's communication toolbox. The five minute fast track is open to any UK undergraduate involved in undergraduate research or creative activity in any major. Today, we will hear from six of the competitors who will be presenting live via the virtual Zoom platform. This event is being recorded. We encourage the panel of judges and our audience to ask questions. Judges will ask their questions verbally. However, we also encourage the virtual audience to use the Q&A button located on their screens at, on their toolbox, usually at the bottom of your screen, if you're not familiar with where that is. Now I would like to introduce and thank our panel of judges who have committed their time to be with us today. Dr. Michael Bardo, Department of Psychology, College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Ming in the College of Health Sciences. Dr. Robert Hirsch, who is in the College of Ag and Biotechnology. Dr. Margaret Schroeder, College of Education, STEM Education. And Carol Street, UK Library Special Collections Research Center. At this time, I'm gonna briefly review the rules of the competition before we get started. Students will first introduce themselves when their name appears on the screen. Their five minute presentation time will officially begin once the slot, their slide appears. Students must be finished talking by the end of the five minutes or they will be disqualified. Their slide will be removed from the screen at the end of five minutes. Each student's slide will reappear for Q&A. After tomorrow's second preliminary round, the judges will stay on um, and 10 student finalists will be announced of who will be moving on to the final round of competition next Tuesday, October 20th at 5 p.m. in the Warsham Cinema. No public audience will be allowed during that time. However, the event will be live streamed on YouTube and on Facebook. So we encourage um, the audience today to join us next week. Now, without further ado, let the competition begin. Our first presenter is a, Ms. Olivia Huffman. Hello, I'm Olivia Huffman. I am a senior psychology major here at UK. I'm also on the swimming and dive team and I am part of the P20 Motivation and Learning Lab led by Dr. Ellen Usher. So without further ado, I'm excited to present my research to you guys today. As a swimmer for UK, I faced unique challenges when transitioning into college. In addition to the typical concerns of adjusting to college life and meeting academic demands, I also had to adjust to the rigorous athletic demands. For these reasons, I also noticed that people made assumptions about athletes and our academic abilities. They assume that athletes are more generally less academically talented than our non-athlete peers. Students seem to be naturally gifted with ability in their sport, but in the class are implicitly told that they are less naturally um, able in academics. So this led me to wonder, do the academic self-beliefs of student athletes differ from non-student athletes in their first year of college? Specifically, I wanted to investigate 
the differences in how students view ability. So as you can see on the left side of the screen, this ability mindset is when you view a task as a fixed trait or something you can grow or change. Students may think, I cannot change how good I am at math. On the other side of the screen, I describe self-efficacy or confidence. Students may think, I am not able to learn material in this class. In general, these two self-beliefs are important predictors of how well students will do in college. During a three year long project, we surveyed over 6,000 undergraduate first year students about their self beliefs at the beginning of students first semester. Of those 6,000 participants, 127 um, we found were student athletes. From that, we used propensity score matching to select a comparison group of non athletes based on gender, race, high school achievement and parental education level. We then compared the ability mindset and self-efficacy beliefs reported by students in each group. T-test analyses suggested that student athletes differ significantly from non-athletes on both ability mindset and self-efficacy. Students reported a more fixed mindset about their intelligence and math abilities. They also reported lower confidence compared to their peers for self-efficacy and humanity subjects. So why might these differences exist? One reason they may differ is that student athletes um, may be more calibrated and realistic about their abilities, leading them to report more accurately than non-student athletes. Although this is something that needs to be investigated more. However, I was shocked to find that athletes had a more fixed mindset about their academic abilities compared to their peers. Athletes train hard to break, their, like, break through physical barriers on a regular basis. They tangibly can see improvement in their athletic ability, but these experiences do not seem to transfer to the classroom. As researchers, educators, coaches, mentors and peers, additional support may be needed for our first year student athletes as they make this transition to college. Researchers have repeatedly shown that when students believe their academic ability is something that can't be changed, their academic performance suffers. Providing this extra support to student athletes in this way may ensure that they all can grow in every aspect of their development, and excel academically, not just in their sport. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. Go Cats! Hi, um, Olivia, Robert Hirsch here. Um, I wanted to see if you had any sense of what sports these athletes um, participated in. Uh, because, and again, it's somewhat anecdotal, but I could imagine certain sports coming in with probably um, higher academic aptitude than others. And I would wonder if that was factored into these analyses. Right. So this was definitely one of our limitations that we wish we could have looked at sport um, differences within the sport, but we did not have access to that um, in our data. So um, Regarding our analyses, this is why we use propensity score matching so that we could match um, student athletes with non-athletes on their academic levels. Thank you. Olivia, thank you so much. This has been really interesting and um, it provides so many avenues for further exploration and how we can assist um, student athletes um, but I was wondering, I wasn't sure if you mentioned if this was all UK students or was it from different universities? Um, this was from a large land grant university um, in the SEC, so just one singular university. Thank you. Um, and as a follow up, what are some areas that you see continuing this research? Um, you like to see it go? Yes, personally, I would love to investigate. Uh, revenue versus non-revenue. 
athletes, I think that could, could influence outcomes um, with academic identity and athletic identity and like in relation to academic um, performance. Thank Were you. you able to look at any potential sex differences? Um, we did not look at that, but that is something that we could investigate in the future. Does anyone else have any more questions for Olivia? Uh, if I could just jump in too, and sorry for the second question here, Olivia, but do you think there would be any difference in these um, data, whether based upon whether or not the athlete was part of a team sport versus more of an individualized sport? Yes, I would, I would think from just personal experience that individual sports would differ from team sports. In which direction would you think that might occur? Team versus individual? Good question. Um, I think that student athletes who play individual sports may have higher levels of self-efficacy and maybe lower levels of fixed mindset. So they would have more of a growth mindset just because they are um, caring more about their own performance and self-beliefs and, and separate from a team. Okay. If there are no further questions for Olivia, we will move on to the next presenter. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. So we're gonna take just a few minutes and allow the judges to make some notes and comments before we move to the next presenter. Please bear with us. Judges, do you need any more time? Great, thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Miss Amy Keith. Hi everyone, my name is Amy Keith and I am a Health Society and Populations major with a biology minor and a certificate in health communication. I'm a senior here at UK. I also serve as an involvement advisor in the Office of Student Organizations and Activities, just trying to give you a little bit about myself. And I am super excited to present to you all my research today. So thank you for having me. It was eye-opening and helped me see that there are so many distinctive and unique people in the world. Hello, my name is Amy Keith and I'm honored to present to you my qualitative research, Distinctive and Unique People, Healthcare Students, Discomfort in Defining Diversity. Up until this point, there's been a lack of research on diversity-related courses that has more than one data collection period. 
Also, diversity research had not been conducted in many healthcare-related fields. Our research sought to fill these gaps by collecting three time points of data in a course taught to pre-health students. Our research aimed to answer the question about how such a course would have an effect on views of diversity over the semester. So this course consisted of 30 undergraduate students, all pre-health, and primarily white and female students. There was a service component as well as a lab facilitated by trained individuals to stimulate critical thinking, and this was not a graded part of the course, but so it served as a safe space for individuals to talk through diversity-related topics. There were three assignments that were used as our data that you can see on the slide there. Time one was before the start of the course, time two was a midterm assignment, and time three was their final assignment. By looking over the responses which served as our data, we were able to look for similar ways diversity-related topics were discussed. We then grouped together these quotes from the responses and named them accordingly, and that is what we call themes. So we then refined these to make sure that they were accurately named. And throughout this process, our research team also thought of how our backgrounds might affect our reactions to the data and made sure to document them and talk to other team members to try and ensure our data was not compromised by these internal feelings. Some of these backgrounds that could have affected the sorting of our data into themes and subthemes were that many of the research team were white and valued diversity. So for these three sets of data, we named at each time based on how the students were processing their discomfort. So at time one, the students were initially experiencing discomfort. At time two, students reacted to their discomfort. And at time three, students reflected on their discomfort. From there, we broke down our data even further into three additional components of each theme called subthemes. Time one was characterized by students initially experiencing discomfort. Students relied on language that wasn't their own, possibly because they were afraid of failing to understand diversity or were unfamiliar with discussing diversity. Some students also did not name the words privilege and race, instead tiptoeing around these concepts by using phrases such as distinctive and unique people. Lastly, students did not associate being white with being diverse, indicating that this primarily white class might see themselves as the norm. Time two was characterized by students reacting to their discomfort. Many students put in their midterm assignment that they were uncomfortable speaking about diversity to their peers for fear of being seen as unpopular or uneducated. Some students specifically named their discomfort, some of which was due to their realization of their participation in systems of oppression, such as racism. Others also felt as if they had they could promptly end their participation in these systems of oppression, excusing themselves from continued discomfort and actively working against these systems of oppression. Lastly, time three was characterized by students reflecting on their discomfort and on the course in general. Some students rejected discomfort, calling the course a hoax, and some students saw their social justice work as complete and deem themselves as experts in the material and fit to be educators to their peers. Uh, and that would be classified under the allowing discomfort. And then some students embrace this discomfort, seeing social justice as a lifelong process that extended past the confines of the course. So these results are consistent with the transformational learning principles that encourage application of diversity related topics in courses that have service components as well as a facilitated safe space for students to work through their discomfort in discussing diversity related topics. So future directions include, uh, we are now expanding our research to follow up with students from uh, years past to see how this course has impacted their lives and whether they attribute that impact to the course specifically. Thank you so much for your attention and I appreciate you all having me here today. I will now be taking any questions you have. Very nice presentation and on an important topic, I'm wondering, at the end there, uh, in time three, what percentage of students fell into each of the categories? You, you didn't mention that. Yes. Uh, so there. Um, so in qualitative data, we usually don't rely on a lot of uh, numerical data, but I, I do have um, 
off the top of my head that, that data. So I believe only uh, three of the 30 students fell into the rejecting discomfort, which um, for the purpose of the course was very, um, very applaudable. And then uh, the majority, I believe uh, two thirds of the, the participants fell into allowing discomfort. Um, so seeing themselves or seeing their journey as um, learning about diversity related topics and social justice in general as basically complete by the end of the course. And then um, the other one third um, fell into the embracing discomfort. So certainly um, a little bit more uh, centered around the allowing discomfort piece. Interesting, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to uh, say this is really uh, interesting uh, a project you're doing and uh, and trying to evaluate the the impact on the, the the students how their learning goes in this particular course um, i'm just curious in your experiences i i imagine so you go through this course as well um, just how this course has impact on the student i know you mentioned about reflecting on discomfort and also the future direction you try to uh, the, the the research team is trying to follow up with the student uh, just right off this uh, end of this class, do you see what kind of impact of this on the student in terms of their um, their attitude or learnings on this diversity besides just this uh, reflecting uh, dimension? I don't know if you can comment anything on that. Yes, yes, awesome. Thank you so much for your question. So um, we're actually working on the manuscript for this uh, project right now. So this is very fresh in my brain. Uh, and so something that uh, the transformational learning theory and also uh, the white identity model um, talks about uh, this actually um, and how courses like this might impact the students. So some students uh, and we as a research team discuss this, how how do some students actually um, get to the allowing discomfort? How do, how do some re-entrench in their beliefs that um, diversity related topics are a hoax and we shouldn't have any uh, discussion time related to them? And that's a great question, uh, but it really does uh, tie back into this identity model. And um, for most students, this was their first uh, diversity related course specifically. Um, of course, a lot of other classes designate time to discuss these topics, but it wasn't the central idea of the course. So going forward, um, trying to utilize this time and make sure it is as impactful as it can be without pushing people to a level of discomfort that they designate it as a hoax or they re-entrench in their uh, previous beliefs about diversity without uh, allowing any discomfort um, or seeing incongruence between their ideals. Um, that is something that we asked as a research team to each other, where, uh, how do these individual differences occur, as well as how do they relate to the literature right now? Um, of, and that is seen in the literature that there are these differences. Um, some students do go past that initial rejecting and go into the allowing and even embracing discomfort, whereas some people might go to the allowing discomfort and then go back to the rejecting discomfort. And that hasn't yet been explained in literature, but again, we are doing further uh, research, following up with students, seeing what they um, have used from the class, whether or not they attributed that to the course. And then also seeing maybe if they can reflect on how they felt during the course uh, years removed from it. Amy, uh, question. a question. Oh uh, yeah, no, sorry, um, Amy. What uh, was this a required class for the students in your program? I I am not in this program. I I did research on this program, but it was a required course for students in this program. Yes. Okay, and uh, okay, then let me see if I can formulate a question based on that. Because if it if it wasn't, then I was curious about how the how that would um, you know, impact the, the students who enroll in the class and maybe some preconceived notions they have of diversity. For sure, for sure. Uh, this was, <laughs> there, I will say this, there were two sections of this course. And um, as I mentioned in the uh, 
methods essentially part of the presentation. Uh, there were service learning aspects and a lab component to this course. The other section of this course did not have those um, components. So this was the only um, one like this, essentially. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Amy, I was wondering about, um, since this is in the healthcare field, um, was it, were the activities or the discussions dedicated to healthcare related topics or were they very general um, issues of diversity? They were very general uh, issues of diversity. However, what we saw in uh, some students was that they would uh, differentiate between the professional and the personal aspects of their lives. And uh, we saw this as maybe trying to uh, manage that discomfort by saying, oh, okay, maybe I can compartmentalize this into applying these diversity topics maybe to my professional life and not taking that home. Um, but all of the activities and the discussions were very generalized. Uh, one of the actual activities that was uh, more of a like service learning components was that they partnered up with, an, with a nonprofit um, in the area to learn about um, differently abled uh, communities and how they could uh, support those in the area, as well as doing a project where they had to try to find a meal for five dollars for a family of four and then find transportation that was not their own car and that sort of thing and uh, reflect on that experience as well. Uh, so these were not necessarily tied to healthcare, but in the reflections they would tie it to healthcare and tie it to how they would see themselves as future providers in saying that I want to be able to help my um, my patients that come from whatever background they may, and that's why this is important to me. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it does, thank you. And my other um, follow-up question is, what level um, were these students? Were they freshmen? Were they juniors, seniors? Yes, great question. So the, this was an upper level um, course in the program, uh, and it was a required course. This was a junior or senior. Most of them were juniors. Thank you so much. Thank you. We do have a question from the um, audience, Amy, and the question is, was it intentional for participants to be only white and female? Uh, the answer is no. So that is just how uh, the people who registered for the course ended up being. Uh, it turns out that that reflects the overall composition of this program in general. Um, but no, that is actually a limitation of our study is that we uh, cannot, uh, we didn't have a very like diverse pool of um, participants in terms of socioeconomic status, race, and gender. Amy, do you, and this may be on the scope of what you did, but uh, I would imagine that uh, healthcare programs may skew a little bit more white and a little bit more female, similar to um, sort of standard enrollment trends we see in different university systems. Like for example, the College of Ag is about 70% white and 70% female, as is my academic program in Ag. Um, so could you, uh, could you maybe speak to how that kind of reality of the enrollment of some of these programs may actually be a benefit to this model um, in terms of reaching this specific constituency? Sure. Uh, so like I said, uh, we did find it as a limitation to the study just in the broad scheme of academia, but in a way it does uh, represent the larger pool of um, health pre-health uh, students that we are seeing right now um of course that is not um that that changes very rapidly but right now it does seem as though many pre-health programs are predominantly white upper class uh females so this study does in some way uh reflect the current pool of pre-health students
Well, um, thank you, Amy, for answering all those questions. Um, we do need to move on. So thank you very much. Judges, we're gonna give you a minute to uh, make any notes that you want to, to uh, annotate at this time. Thank you all. Judges, are you ready? Okay. All right. Our next presenter is Kaylee Bolton. Hello, everyone. My name is Kaylee Bolton, and I am a sophomore and biology major at the University of Kentucky. Uh, I am participating in undergraduate research in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry in Dr. Matthew Gentry's lab. And today I will be presenting on abnormal glycogen accumulation and altered glycosylation in brain tumors. Imagine the University of Kentucky's Rupp Arena filled completely to its capacity with people. This arena can hold 23,500 people, and yet to visualize the number of individuals expected to receive a brain tumor diagnosis in this year alone would take nearly four Rupp arenas. It is estimated that 87,240 people will receive a brain tumor diagnosis in 2020. Nearly one-fifth of the individuals who receive a brain cancer diagnosis are expected to die fighting that cancer. And those who do live are at a higher risk of living with impaired cognition and physical health. Brain tumors are both diverse and complex in composition, and these qualities cause them to be difficult to diagnose and treat effectively. Two characteristics that have been connected to the progression of brain cancer are abnormal accumulation of glycogen and altered glycosylation. Glycogen is the main storage form of glucose in the body and as such acts as an energy currency. Glycosylation is a modification in which sugars called glycans are attached to biomolecules to modulate their structure and function. With these characteristics in mind, we conducted a molecular study analyzing the profile of 106 human samples whose initial brain cancer grade level varied from one to four. We first performed a tissue microarray sectioning of these samples to prepare them for tests. Then, the first technique that we utilized was immunohistochemistry, or IHC as I'll refer to it throughout this presentation, coupled with halo imaging software. IHC is the traditional method whereby tumors are scored in the pathology lab and is a technique to identify biomarkers utilizing the relationship between antibodies and antigens. The antibody we used is against glycogen. The second technique we then utilized was mass spectrometry imaging, or MSI as I'll refer to it throughout the duration of this presentation. MSI is a novel methodology that has been recently utilized for analyzing the sugar composition in lung cancer. However, it has not been yet applied to brain tumors. MSI is a powerful tool for the visualization of biomolecules using their molecular mass and can be used to classify tumors, produce molecular images with substantial spatial resolution, and collect significant biochemical information. Then we took the respective uh, glycogen abundances and glycan abundances from both of these techniques to analyze and further understand the role of glycogen and glycosylation in the progression of brain cancer. Our first results pertaining to glycogen abundancy were taken from both the IHC and MSI platforms. And as you can see in figures 2A and 2C, there is a direct relationship between glycogen abundancy and brain cancer grade level. 
This is also visually represented in figure 2b with the halo images and in figure 2d with the MSI images. The cooler colors correspond to lower amounts of glycogen, whereas the hotter colors correspond to higher amounts of glycogen. The second results we collected were specifically on the glycosylation and taken solely from the MSI platform. As you can see in figure 2E, there is a connection between glycan abundancy and therefore glycosylation and the progression of brain tumors. For select glycans, as abundancy increases, brain, can brain cancer grade level also increases, similarly to the glycogen. However, for other glycans, as abundancy decreases, brain cancer grade level increases. This is seen specifically with glycan 1257 that is also visually represented in figure 2F. For the control image, you can see it is dominated by mostly hot colors, showing a high glycan abundancy. And then as brain cancer grade level increases, the images become dominated by cooler colors, showing a decrease in that glycan abundancy. Overall, our results are important because they show significant insight into the composition of brain tumors. And excitingly, the MSI platform has recently been utilized in the clinic for lung cancer to define the edges of cancer tissue and guide resections. And we hope that our work can also be utilized to make these critical decisions in the clinic. Also, with further research, our work may lead to the discovery of biomarkers and novel targets in the treatment and diagnosis of metastasizing brain tumors in humans. And overall, an earlier recognition of the signs of brain cancer will lead to an earlier interference in that disease. And this is pertinent to the estimated over 700,000 people living in the United States today with a brain tumor. Thank you for listening to my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. I was curious about the grading of the cancer from one to four and the control so that when you received the samples, they were already graded or you graded them yourself? No, these were all already graded. Um, we received them from collaborators. So that was the, the sample preparation all took place before we got the samples. And where do you get this? When you say control, what? So. I'm assuming that these tumors are um, throughout different parts of the brain, right? So what would be a control part of the brain that you would use for comparison that on the le far left side? Um, I know there are there, have, there were different controls um, throughout the study. I know particularly in doing um, some of the analyzing with the halo imaging software, some examples I would see would actually be like um, uh, like a sample taken from like a breast tissue or like actually different um, organs, but um, it, it varied uh, overall. Okay, thank you for your answer. Thank you for your question. Hi Katie, uh, I also like to just ask you a quick question. So, but first of all, I want to uh, let you know uh, my I, uh, my training background is in industrial engineering, so I have no idea about this uh, different uh, chemical, uh, different testing or uh, examination imaging uh, techniques you did, but it sounds really cool. Uh, it sounds like this, this uh, different uh, tools or, or imaging techniques can help you to, uh, to find out these key information. So I'm just curious. As you uh, see the current result, and, uh, although you mentioned briefly about uh, this can help with like, um, uh, assuming it's diagnosis of the brain cancer tumor uh, situations. And I, I guess just how, how would this, how, how did you, how do your team uh, perceive this will be able to actually utilize in a real clinical setting? I don't know how this compares to the current approach um, when they tried to uh, detect the uh, brain tumor. And they did a biopsy, and are, would, would this can help to avoid that, or can um, offer early detection of the brain tumor? Just curious how how these uh, applications in the future. Okay, let me know for sure if I answer your question. But um, of course, we want to do further research into the possibilities of what this imaging can do. But I think just some examples would include, like yes, earlier detection um, in patients, but also 
maybe something similar as with the lung cancer where they can define the tumor and then use that to cut the tumor out to resection it. And I think if our research could take it somewhere similarly for brain cancer, then it would be a huge advancement. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only one who is not in the healthcare sciences field. Um, I want to commend you on your graphics. I think they're very strong and they, they really make a very complicated research project easy to understand, which is hard to do. Um, so I know you spent a lot of time on that. Um, and just maybe kind of talking about where does cancer in the brain fall under um, how easy it is to detect? Um, is it, um, are other cancers easier to find? Is brain cancer the hardest? You know, where does it fall into the category? I can't speak on behalf of other cancers. Um, I would have to do further research into that, but I think uh, particularly with brain cancer, it is difficult because you're not going to see the same characteristics in every patient. Whereas like this shows at least something that they can look for. And I think right now it is difficult to find things that they can pinpoint to look for when they're diagnosing people with brain cancer. Um, but in terms of its difficulty compared to other cancers, I can't speak on exactly, but I would just say in general, um, all cancers are very hard to diagnose because of the huge variability and the symptoms that show up. Sorry. Thank I hope you. that actually answered your question. <laughs> Hi, Kaylee, Dr. Hersher. Um, I, have a, I always ask this question when, especially kind of an earlier career student like you, you said you were a sophomore, uh, presents on um, something this complicated and complication aside, these sort of studies, as you know, take a long time to do. So, um, you know, student participation is not uh, necessarily uh, or at all a, a part of our rubric that we're assessing you on. But I'm just curious, how much of this stuff did you actually do? Because Dr. Gentry has presumably been working on this for a long time. Um, yes, and I am so lucky to be in Dr. Gentry's lab and actually get to work under um, Dr. Jessica Macedo, who is um, my mentor, she has really led me through this project and um, she's, she's helped me participate in a lot actually in terms of um, analyzing, which really is some of the hardest part in my opinion. But she, um, with the Halo imaging software especially, um, I actually get to go in and go through all of the individual samples and um, go with the programming with that. and. She leads me through um, the protocols and helps me participate actually quite heavily in this um, whole study. And um, yeah, I, I feel like although I am newer that they really helped bring me in and educate me on what I needed to know to um, put forth valuable work into the study. And, Okay, thank you. And I think to follow up on a question that Dr. Ming had, um, it seems like this is kind of destructive sampling. So you're taking brain tissue out and then analyzing it. Um, how can this sort of in vitro test or, you know, taking it something, you know, taking it out of a body and holding it, how can this translate into something diagnostic or a surgeon maybe could utilize during a brain cancer surgery in a way that like won't excise more brain tissue from a patient? I think to um, answer that question, it really goes into the need to do further research into related mechanisms, because right now we're looking at, okay, this abundancy is higher in these cancer tissues, but we really need to know what mechanisms that might be relating and not exactly causing, but relating to this increase in abundancies. And I think that'll be the most important part to have a the ability to diagnose patients without being so invasive. So I think that definitely was a limitation here. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Kaylee, this is Jesse. Um, you have two questions um, from the audience. The first one is in light of this discovery, what do you imagine could be a therapeutic solution to abnormal levels of glycogen in brain tumors? 
Um, just from what I personally think that um, they could go into doing this would maybe be looking into like um, enzymes or like enzymes that are working with um, other parts of cells that like that can be invasive into the cells and possibly go in and um, break up that uh, abundant glycogen. I'm really speaking more into it could lead to a similar um, treatment as what my lab is also doing with Lefora disease and looking at um, Lefora bodies. So maybe something similar with that where there could be some kind of um, medicine that they could put into the cells that could go in and help break up that abundant glycogen. But that's just for me saying <laughs> what I think. <laughs> Good answer, Kaylee. And then your second question from the audience is, where did your interest in brain tumors come from? Okay, um, well, actually, <laughs> I have a huge interest in um, researching cancer just in general because I have had very close family members um, pass away from cancer, but then also more specifically into brain cancer because I also know people specifically who ha are living with life altering symptoms from having a brain tumor. Um, and I think that the research is so important to me because I might be able to improve their standing, their standard of living one day. And that's really the goal. Nice job answering those questions, Kaylee. Does anybody have any last minute ones for her? Thank you for all the questions. Okay, judges, you will have one minute. Judges, it looks like you're, you may be ready. Is that correct? Okay, so we'll continue. Awesome. Our next presenter is Miranda Kunis. My name is Miranda Kunis. I am a senior in the equine science and management major with a minor in German. And I've been conducting equine nutrition research with Dr. Lori Lawrence in the College of Agriculture. Today, I will be talking to you about how equine nutritionists use horse feces to better understand how they digest their food. So horses are grazing herbivores that consume a diet mainly consisting of forages such as grass and hay that are high in cellulose. However, modern management practices often supplement these diets with starch, high starch concentrate feeds for horses that have limited pasture access or high energy demands such as racehorses. Cellulose, as seen in the top left, is a long chain of glucose molecules connected by what are called beta-1,4 glycosidic bonds. These bonds are unable to be digested by the horse's own enzymes, so instead, as indicated by the blue arrow, they are digested by the microbial community that lives commensally in the horse's large intestine or hindgut. Starch, similarly, is a glucose uh, molecule chain connected by alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, which are able to be digested by the horse's own enzymes. When fed in small amounts, this is done in the horse's small intestine. However, as occurs sometimes, there is too much starch fed to the horse and the enzymes are overloaded. So the excess starch flows into the large intestine where it is also digested and fermented by the microbes living there. This fermentation causes a decrease in the pH of the hindgut 
making it an acidic environment, which disrupts the hindgut community of microbes and suppresses cellulose digestion. Our question with this is if the starch itself as a molecule or the pH changes caused by it are the inhibitory agents to cellulose digestion. In order to study this, we had an in vitro experimental setup that mimicked the horse's hindgut digestion. In the middle, you can see pictures of jars that contain buffer solutions and fresh feces that were blended together. These solutions were set to various pHs and as you can see in the top right hand corner in the line graph. And I like to note that the colors in the jars do not necessarily match the line graph colors. The blue line indicates the most acidic jar solution, which is at about 6.5 before incubation. The green jar marks the most basic solution that was about 7.6. These jars were, played, were made anaerobic so that the microbes wouldn't die in an oxygenated environment and then were incubated and rotated for 48 hours to mimic the horse's uh, intestine, large intestinal environment. The pH was measured before and after incubation and digestion was tracked during this time. The slope of the lines indicate how much fermentation or digestion occurred. So the blue line has the smallest or least steep slope indicating that not very much fermentation or digestion occurred. However, the green line shows a much steeper slope indicating that more fermentation occurred in that more basic environment. If we look at the bar graph in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see blue bars and red bars. The blue bars mark the control group, that, which we use a forage called Timothy Hay, and notice its digestibility, which did not change very much in all four jars. However, the red lines indicate the digestibility of the cellulose. Please note that the most basic jar on the far right had the most digestion of cellulose. And as you go down and increase the pH, decrease the pH and increase the acidity, the digestibility of the cellulose also decreases. So that the most acidic jar had about half the amount of cellulose digested as the most basic jar. This indicates that it is likely the acidic environment created by starch digestion in the hindgut that causes the suppression of cellulose digestion. So you might be asking yourself at this point, that's great, but why should I care about what a horse eats? And I think that's a great question. And to that, I would remind us how integral the horse is to the spirit of the state of Kentucky. Not only is it important in our culture and entertainment, but it also is a vital portion of our economy. In Fayette County alone, the equine assets add up to a multi-billion dollar industry. So as we improve the health of the horse and increase the efficiency of its care, we're also optimizing the well-being of our state as a whole. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hi, Miranda. Um, so interesting talk. Um, and I, th I think, you know, I, I'm pretty familiar with your guys' program and I go to a lot of horse, horse talks. Um, so it seems like balancing starch with cellulose is important, especially as you mentioned for sort of nutrient um, uh, intensive um, lifestyles like racing horses. So if you add more starch, which will provide more nutrition, it, it kind of stops the cellulose. I get that. Would there be, but since it's a factor of pH, would there, or could there be other dietary amendments given to that horse to then buffer or correct the pH fluctuations in the gut system to then allow more optimization of the horse's feed into energy? That's a great question because like you said with race horses, we do have this problem of these animals burn a lot of calories. And so they really do need a high energy food source such as starch. So how can we counterbalance that? And what we hope to do in the future with this research, so we want to later introduce starch itself to the solution and see if we can modulate the pH with the starch versus we use strong acids and bases in this circumstance. And additionally, after we explore that, we'd like to see if we could remedy this perhaps with probiotics or prebiotics to see if introducing other natural microbial species will help restore that balance so that we can continue feeding these high energy starch diets without completely um, dismantling and disrupting the horse's hindgut microbial community. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, just one other question, and I don't know anything yeah. about equine physiology, but could you could you just give them like Tums or baking powder, you know, or uh, or something that like humans would take for heartburn? Does that sort of chemistry make it down into the intestines, or does it neutralize stomach acid and then stop? That's a really interesting question. Um, so Tums, are, I believe, are work as a proton pump inhibitor, and they act in the stomach. So the stomach is pumping like hydrochloric acid through these proton pumps, and so you inhibit those prevent the stomach from making acid. And actually horses can't have acidic reflux because their esophageal sphincter is really tight. And so there's actually mechanisms in the horse's small intestine in the beginning of the duodenum to um, buffer and like neutralize the, the acidity. So that's already neutralized before we even get to the hind intestine. Um, I wish that was, it was easier like that, but thank you for your question. <laughs> thank you. So Miranda, does um, the excess starch in these horses, does it cause colic? It can, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for those who don't know, colic is like extreme uh, gastrointestinal distress for horses. And as a horse owner or manager, if you see a horse colicking, like you call your vet immediately and you're very concerned. Um, so yeah, in extreme cases, uh, this can lead to uh, what's called acidosis. So lots of acidity in the horse's hind gut to a very unhealthy level, like a pH of five, which we didn't even get close to in this experiment. And like, as you approach that threshold, like you will see more chances of colic in a horse. Thank you. And that's exactly where I, my mind was going to, um, because Evie and I are both horse owners. Uh, so, does this mean that we should be looking for feeds that have a higher pH and are more base than acidic? Or did you, did the research go any further to test common feeds in the area? Um, and did you use specific feeds for the starches? It's a good question. So. We have not yet introduced a starch to this specific experiment, but as far as your question, one, I have to plug um, the College of Ag's extension uh, portion of their program. So as a land grant university, UK has an extension program and we have an equine specialist that is um, devoted to teaching the public about better ways to feed their horses. Um, but to answer your question specifically right now, um, so the starch itself isn't necessarily acidic. It's the, the bacteria that are designed to digest that uh, starch create uh, create more acid, even like especially lots of lactic acid, and the cellulolytic bacteria can't survive in an acidic environment. So when we feed, you're always advised by an equine nutritionist to feed a forage first diet. Like starch should barely be a portion, especially uh, you have to look at the energy level of your horse. So if your horse isn't exercising as much as um, like a thoroughbred, like you're really not going to need much starch. So always trying to get forage like haze first and maybe invest in higher quality haze like alfalfa. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, uh, Miranda, I, I want to ask you three <laughs> naive questions again. Uh, so this uh, this is really cool. Um, I, I didn't know uh, you could, I, I hope I understand correctly, but you mentioned about the one of your methods uh, when you uh, mixing those four jars and you try to shake in a way to simulate the how the movement goes in inside the host body. So, so could you just describe that a little more? How like how how did you shake or how how long it takes to to do this process uh, yeah. to be to actually uh, simulate the the, the 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 actual process? Yes, good question. So we use a protocol um, called like an ANCON DAISY protocol and it's uh, a company makes a spe special incubator called an ANCON DAISY incubator. And this is common actually in cattle research. And there are verified methods um, by equine scientists to know how to use this for horses because it pertains to like what temperature we set it to and the buffers we use. However, this incubator, um, it, it's set up so you hold these big jars in it and the jars have the solution and they have these filter bags that contain the different substrates, so Timothy hay and cellulose. And then you put it in this like box that's sealed and it rotates and keeps the temperature constant. 
So it helps that it mimics like the peristalsis activities or the movement wave activity of the intestines. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Miranda, we have a question from the audience. She, this question is, I am a gardener. Can I use horse poop as a fertilizer, especially due to the acidity involved? I love that question. One member um, of our lab group, her name is Dr. Fowler, specifically studies um, how like runoff from a horse feces like affects the local environment and its ability to be used as manure. And I, I would say, I'm not an expert in this, but there are people, again, in like extension and research who are experts. And I would just caution you to be careful that a lot of horse diets are gonna supplement important uh, minerals and vi like that can um, be fed in really high amounts to the horse because they need it, but then also shed in higher amounts that your garden might not necessarily need. So it, it's possible, but it might not be the most efficient method of fertilizing your garden. Are there any more questions for Miranda? Okay, nice presentation, Miranda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, judges, you'll have one minute. Judges, are you all ready? Awesome. Moving on, our next presenter is Oscar. Hi, everyone. My name is Oscar Istis. I'm a senior here at UK studying biology and entomology. And for the past couple of years, I've been doing research with Dr. Robin Cooper in the biology department, primarily looking at physiology and neuroscience. So our research started taking a look at the disease septicemia, or sepsis. Some of you might have heard of this condition. Um, it's a result of an immune response to a bacterial infection. Now, normally an immune response to a bacterial infection sounds like it would be a good thing, but in this case, it's mistargeted and too strong. And instead of getting rid of the harmful bacteria, it ends up influencing our tissues and organs, and frequently they shut down as a response. Now, the actual bacterial component uh, responsible for this is a small toxin located on the outside of gram-negative bacteria called lipopolysaccharides, or LPS. Sometimes, even when patients are given antibiotics and these bacteria are killed, the toxin can stay in their system and tri trigger a bacterial response later, um, causing this septic condition. While some research has been done into how this toxin is bringing about this effect, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Relatively recently, however, some parts of the world have begun using blowfly larvae uh, to try and mitigate this response. Blowfly larvae are pretty used to feeding on dead tissue, so they come into contact with gram-negative bacteria and this LPS pretty frequently. By introducing them to our infected wounds, they'll eat this bacteria and this toxin um, without hurting themselves and preventing a septic response from triggering later. In our lab, we're really curious how these organisms are capable of feeding on this toxin without hurting themselves. So we decided to take a look at fruit fly larvae. Fruit fly larvae are not only structurally very similar to blowfly larvae, 
but their physiology is also very well understood. So we hope that we might be able to compare their responses to other organisms like humans. Um, in order to test this, we ran a couple of different experiments. We started by mixing cornmeal and some LPS to make our own food mixture. And we would let our fruit fly larvae feed on this for a couple of days. Um, after that time, we would transfer our larvae to a clean plate with uncontaminated food and see how much of that food they ate over the next minute. Um, we would look at their little mouth hooks and how many times they um, stuck them out to intake food from the environment around them. After that, we would transfer them to another clean plate and perform a light touch assay using a small dowel with a toothbrush bristle hot glued to the end, actually. Um, we would tap them on the side just to see how they responded to our touch. Uh, through these two experiments, we hope to see whether the LPS that they were ingesting negatively influenced really important behaviors like feeding and their nervous system in general and ability to respond to what's going on around them. We also performed a few intracellular recordings by dissecting unaffected larvae um, in such a way that they were still alive after we cut them open. And then we would take electrodes and stimulate their muscle fibers um, to see the electrical activity in these muscles before and after we dripped LPS onto them. Now, the results from these experiments weren't exactly what we expected. We thought we would see something more similar to the blowflies and how they can consume this toxin without necessarily hurting themselves or demonstrating any adverse reactions, but that isn't what we saw. Um, in my first couple of graphs on the right over here um, is some of the data for our research, and we saw that the mouth hook movements or how much food our larvae that had been feeding on LPS um, demonstrated were significantly higher than the larvae that hadn't been feeding on LPS. This means that they were eating even more food um, and demonstrated some difficulty in knowing how much food they should be consuming or in digesting that food. Um, in my lower graph, I record some of the um, light touch assay results showing that our larvae that had been feeding on LPS had a more difficult time responding to our touch stimulation than the larvae that hadn't been feeding on LPS. Uh, this means that their nervous systems had difficulty processing this toxin as well and made it difficult for them to interpret what was going on around them. Our intracellular recordings showed something similar, and after we dropped LPS onto their muscle fibers, um, we saw the electrical activities decrease significantly. Um, my charts on the rightmost picture demonstrate that in close-up, showing that after adding LPS, um, the responses we got were diminished a lot. Uh, we tried washing off this toxin and saw that we were able to get the signals back, so it wasn't permanently damaging any of their machinery. Though we didn't exactly get the results that we anticipated from this and didn't get a better understanding of how the blowflies are able to consume this toxin without hurting themselves, we saw that these responses were actually really similar to how humans react when they ingest this toxin. Um, and we hope that by taking a closer look at the mechanism of LPS influencing these larvae, we can better understand how this septic response occurs in humans and how to better mitigate the damage that humans are experiencing every day as a result of the septic condition. Um, I thank you everyone for your time and I'd really like to answer any questions that you have for me at this point. Thank you, Oscar. This is really cool stuff. Um, in terms of your, uh, for, the, for the data, I have, I have two questions. You, your constant, and they're very small, it's kind of hard to see, but your concentration of uh, LPS is 500 micrograms per milliliter. Um, what, what informed that choice of, of concentration? Is that representative of what we would expect a human immune response to be triggered by? Or um, I guess why that amount specifically? Yeah, good question. Um, the LD50 or the, the lethal, lethal dose that influences many other organisms um, that LPS is studied on is 750 micrograms per milliliter. Um, and we tested a couple concentrations that were around that. We tested um, 1,000 micrograms per milliliter and 750, and it resulted in some of our test subjects dying. So we decreased it even further um, and settled on 500, which left all of our subjects alive um, and thought that this was would be a more accurate representation of what these um, organisms would encounter in their environment. Okay. And, um, and so, and I, I don't understand um, insect or mammalian systems very much, but it seems that septicemia, as you mentioned, was an immune response to this, um, to this LPS, uh, you know, presumably in the bloodstream, whereas you're feeding these larvae. So there's kind of an, uh, like an ingestion versus injection sort of difference. How may that impact the comparability of your larval feeding studies to human bloodborne septicemia? 
Um, it would definitely influence it a lot, um, especially in our two experiments where the larvae did have to feed on the LPS in order for it to be introduced to them. Um, those kind of give us a general idea of, yeah, this toxin influences them, it influences their systems, um, but we know we can't make any direct comparisons to humans, um, given that the introduction of the toxin is different. But when we dissect the larvae and directly administered it to their muscle fibers, um, that's a little bit more similar to how this toxin would um, end up circulating through the bloodstream and impacting organs, tissues, and the muscles of people. So those intracellular recordings um, are actually what gave us a lot more insight into the fact that this could be comparable to humans and to studying how organisms, other organisms, are responding to this toxin. Okay, thank you. And then just one last set of curiosity, why are these larvae eating more when you're feeding them toxins? Um, we had a few hypotheses for that. Um, we took a closer look at the intracellular recordings following this experiment, so we didn't um, delve too much deeper into the mouth hooks. Um, but we think because their nervous systems are impaired as a result of this toxin, um, they don't have a very good perception of how much they have eaten um, and how much they need to eat in order to uh, achieve a threshold. Um, so they're eating contaminated food, and that's influencing what little judgment they have when determining how much food that they need to eat. Um, that and it's influencing some elements of their digestive system. So maybe they really do need to continue eating because it's not possible for them to reach the threshold because they're not getting as many nutrients from their food because it's contaminated. Okay, thank you. I was curious about the touch assay and how you were quantifying that. Uh, how did you, did you have a rating scale or what did you do there? Um, we recorded the different ways that they responded to it. Um, so I know that one of my graphs on here, the writing is a little bit small, but on there we record um, how they responded, whether they moved away from our stimulus, whether they bent towards it, and we had a long list of different types of responses that they demonstrated. Um, ultimately, we didn't see that a ton of those responses were very significant, so we boiled it down to whether they responded to our touch or not. Um, and that's the, the main metric that we used to, to verify our touch assay, um, and we saw that the larvae that had been feeding on LPS um, responded significantly less to our touch than larvae that hadn't been feeding on our LPS. Oscar, we have a question from the audience. How long does a fruit fly larvae remain in this stage before becoming a fruit fly? Good question. Um, so, Fruit fly larvae actually go through a couple different phases before they reach the next stage of their metamorphosis. Um, and while they're in their larvae stage, um, these different forms are called instars. Um, so first instar larvae are quite small, and then they reach second instar and- You have everything you need, here. Alexis. You... Um, second instar larvae come next, and they're a little bit bigger, but still kind of difficult to work with. Um, and what we worked on were third instar larvae. So before they actually come become fruit flies, they have to go through another stage called pupae. Um, and they usually spend about a week in our third instar stage before they would move on to that next pupae stage, which we really couldn't do any research on because it's like them coating themselves in a hard case and sticking to a wall. So uh, Oscar, I, I, I don't know, I may have missed, but uh, could you just describe a little more on the future direction? Um, what's the next steps of your research? Uh, how would you take these results and uh, move on to the next stage? So after this, we were really intrigued by those um, recordings that we got from looking at their muscle fibers. And we wanted to see a little bit more um, about how this toxin could impact that. So we um, changed our methods a little bit and tried a bunch of different combinations of maybe um, trying higher concentrations of our LPS, exposing the muscle fibers to that, seeing what would happen there. Um, we also tried leaving the toxin on even longer, seeing if that damaged the machinery of the muscle fibers, how that affected the intracellular recordings. Um, and we tried to repair the um, fibers afterwards. We would expose them to large amounts of LPS and see if we could wash it off and try to eliminate the septic response or eliminate um, the negative influences of this toxin. Um, we saw that we were able to in a lot of situations, the longer that they were exposed to this toxin, it became more difficult to wash it off and restore it to its normal state. Um, 
but in most cases we were able to and that was uh, pretty unique and pretty incredible to see. Um, a couple other members of our labs have also started working with this toxin on other organisms like crayfish. Um, a few studies have been done in our lab with mice and even a little bit on uh, human brain cells. So those projects are kind of going on right now and they all kind of started in this area looking at fruit flies and how they responded. Any more questions for Oscar? Very nice presentation, Oscar. All right, judges, up to one minute. Okay, we ready judges? Awesome. All right, our next presenter is Sean Meredith. Hi, my name is Sean Meredith. I'm a physics student and I research bioinformatics under Dr. Hunter Mosley in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. And today I'm presenting on protein-protein interactions. So if you imagine right now all of the crazy complicated things going on in your body to sustain life, there's all these different things happening. And the majority of them are regulated by proteins. They're absolutely crucial to life. They perform many of the biochemical functions necessary to sustain it, and they give structure to our cells and tissue. And they actually implement these biological functions through a complex network of interactions with other proteins. If you look at one, this is for a human where each circle is a protein and each edge is an interaction with another protein within it. And as you can see, it's incredibly complex. But what's actually very surprising is that it's also rather incomplete. We only know a fraction of these edges and interactions between proteins. So if we imagine there being a problem at one protein and we could trace it throughout the system, a missing link could be the key factor in understanding any number of biological pathways, diseases, and treatment options, most importantly. And that's why we care so much about predicting protein-protein interactions. Specifically, proteins interact on the surface of an intricate 3D structure. You'll see in two that these are very complicated objects but they, the only places that can interact with another protein are those which are physically located on the surface. And that's one indicator we can use to predict interactions between proteins. If we wanna think about other indicators, we'll have to go back to how proteins are made. And three describes the process of DNA to RNA to protein. DNA has four characters, that ultimately code into 20 amino acid characters within the protein. And the mutations in DNA manifest themselves as mutations in those proteins. But each protein has a specific biochemical function that it's meant to perform. 
And in order to maintain that function, unimportant sites will be allowed to mutate tremendously, while crucial sites to the protein's function will be limited to a small subset of the 20 possible amino acids that can enable that function. And the protein data bank has 180,000 sequences that we can use to leverage and start finding some of this information. This can be visualized in a multiple sequence alignment, as you'll see in four, where we may take, a specific, for instance, hemoglobin. We would take hemoglobin from a human, a cow, a everything and line them up in such a way that a site on the multiple sequence alignment as you go down it we're at a similar site across all of these proteins and we'll see that some of them we are very conserved we'll only have one character all the way down and we might say that these are important areas we'll also see a linkage a covariance between columns wherein this represents multiple amino acids on a protein working together to perform their function. And we've made complicated mathematical models of evaluating both how conserved they are and with any conserved variance that we do see, covariance between its column and another column. And not only can we do this within a protein, we do this across proteins, where every time we see a change in this site, we see a change in that site, we can start to say maybe they're related in some way. And if you look at five, we can look at clusters of indicators between proteins, wherein it's not just one amino acid site on the brown and one on the green. We can find multiple linked sites on the brown and multiple linked sites on the green and be able to say if there's a linkage between those groups, this gives a high level of confidence in predicting our interactions. And finally, the confidence of our predictions can be statistically quantified. Here we have a log scale of a count on all the, all the proteins we've analyzed, how much more likely we are to see a high linkage value corresponding to actual close contact and perceived interaction between these protein complexes. And so while it's a very hard problem, we're making tremendous progress in understanding and predicting these various biological pathways, diseases, and ultimately understanding treatments. Not only will we be able to guess whether two proteins interact, we'll be able to assign some level of confidence to it, and we'll be able to tell exactly at which sites, we hope to be able to tell, at which sites on the two proteins are interacting. So in our one, if we know that they interact at a specific site, we have a problem at that site, we could trace this through the network, and this would gain us much better understanding into, into the system. And by combining all of these indicators and using all of this data, we go. We're making great progress. That's all. I just want to thank you very much. The, the, these bioinformatic talks are always interesting in terms of scope and approach. Um, so, um, a common issue with these sort of in silico analyses is that it's all sort of theoretical and just based on, on, on math and computational uh, skills. What are the next steps to actually verify these relationships in vitro or in vivo? Yes, so we have some items in the protein database that are protein complexes, which are already multiple individual units that are formed together. And so these represent sites of known interaction, and we can actually use these to determine how well we're doing. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, but just like a, uh, I mean, yes, in part, but just like a, a specific approach or um, protocol that you would use to uh, quantify, identify protein-protein interactions in vitro. So, at the end, we are, our end result are a cluster of covariant units on the first protein and a cluster on the other. And then we can check if any of those are in contact and that's how we would determine whether or not uh, we're correct. Okay, thank you. I, I hope that answers.
No, that's it's, it. Was, it was a, it's a very complex uh, sort of situation. So I appreciate your answer. Thank you. So we checked our, our hypothetical pairs and we have the ability to know if we are correct. And we check what amount of those are um, actually correct for a level of accuracy. I find it very interesting with protein protein interaction is certainly extremely important in terms of biological relevance, but even from a basic science perspective. And I'm, and I'm wondering, how do you, what's ultimately, just in a general sense, where would, could this potentially take us in terms of uh, thinking about disease states or about perhaps drugs, how they interact with different proteins? Where, where does this take us in the next step in terms of health relevance? Yes, so um, the output of my program goes to a postdoc in the lab who works with these um, one these networks. And so what he would do is he would find our different interactions and we might be able to trace a problem through one and say, okay, it would lead to these symptoms. Oh, those are the symptoms for this disease that we haven't quite understood yet or we know there's a problem at this protein and we can hyper target where we um, introduce our therapeutics. And so we can use these also rather complicated networks in one to try and make predictions. And a lot of the times uh, in computational, we will make predictions and somebody in a so-called wet lab will go and test them. And so that is kind of nice that we have this uh, ability to give some level of confidence. So if we come out with 50 proposed guesses, nobody has to go and check all 50 of them. They could just check what might seem to be the most promising. And then they, can, they could verify our results or our guesses. Sean, um, Dr. Crawford has a question for you. Dr. Crawford. Hi. Um, <clears throat> Sean, I was wondering what parallels you found between uh, physics and the research you're working on now. Yeah. Ed, so I was actually introduced, it's through um, information theory. Uh, you can use mutual information as it's a mathematical formula to link um, determine whether these two columns are covariant. And that is very much linked with entropy and some ideas in uh, you know, statistical mechanics. And ultimately, I, I would like to uh, maybe pursue this further and not just use the multiple sequence alignment data, but we do have the atom site data and residue positions for these proteins. And perhaps we could uh, implement methods from physics, quantum mechanics, and use those to help in our predictions. Yeah, that'd be interesting if you could uh, apply quantum mechanics, especially. <laughs> uh, also, I was wondering, do you, uh, do you apply uh, machine learning at all? No, all of our, all of our methods are analytic, so to speak. We have a formula that we can write down and we go through each column pair and we go through each pairs of residue transformations and we use this to quantify whether or not these two are linked. Thanks. Since there are so many proteins, did you narrow down the types of proteins or focus on a particular species of proteins? Um, we hope to have very general methods. We are exploring the best proteins, um, exploring whether or not our metric will work on different classes of proteins. To start though, we have um, 1,300 of these known complexes that we can study, and we, those are the main set that we've chosen, being that they have all of the answers already there for us between two interacting proteins. But uh, we are investigating different classes and what might, our, our methods may work better on this one than that one, but that's not something we know quite yet. Thank you. And thank you guys for your questions. 
Uh, very nervous. So. Yeah, but yeah, I think you did a great job. Um, I just you. like to uh, ask, uh, particularly in your title, you say predicting uh, interactions. I know uh, you're trying to analyze and try to find out the covariance uh, correlations co between the, the different locations of the proteins. And I'm just curious, uh, when you do this prediction, um, I mean, so, so it sounds like you're trying to find, you, you, you are trying to find out the relationship rather than predicting. Um, but you, but uh, after this first one of the things, you must have found some relationships you, that can help you predict. Um, so do you plan on using other data to, uh, to validate your prediction or the relationship you have found? Hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> I, it makes sense, absolutely. Um, so we, are, through the, multiple sequence alignment we are looking for relationships in between these columns and we have found that some some pairs of amino acids are more likely to represent contact and some are not um, but that is one aspect we use the surface requirement of the amino acids we use the fact that there must be localized clusters within a protein, all close in space and covariant, and they must be covariant across proteins. And at the end of it, we combine all these things and we, we get a guess between these covariant amino acid sites. And on the known ones, we have the distance, and um, this is what we, we measure being in close contact as a yes, they are interacting. And so even though we won't have that for non-complexes, yes, that will be a time that hopefully our, our ability to stay with some confidence that they are correct and not just throw out too many options. But uh, yes, a lot of the times this stuff gets verified by people working in a wet lab. Uh, who will just take that protein and this protein and you know do what they do see it see what happens see they they know that aspect more than I do maybe thank you thank you any more questions for Sean Okay, thank you, Sean, very much. This concludes our presentations for round one. I would just like to remind everyone that we will continue um, round two tomorrow at the same time. And I hope everyone will join us. And um, judges, just as a reminder for tomorrow night, you will stay on after everyone else um, leaves the room so we can deliberate and discuss. Um, again, thank you very much. Um, I did fail to mention earlier that this competition is being hosted by the Office of Undergraduate Research and we're very proud of this event. So thank you all um, and I hope you all have a nice evening and we'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>